So what uh, what do you do at the trade shows? Well, we you know we show this last trade show which we did in, in uh, San Francisco was we you know debuted some new products. So okay, so that, what's in the pipeline? Can you can you talk about it? Yeah, I mean we've got some ready to eat meals, uh, three ready to eat meals. Actually, there'll be four, but three that are ready to go. So there'll be like instant meals that'll be oh, you wow. know around calories. Uh, what are so they? One's a Thai tom yum soup. Okay. I love one, soup. Keep coming at me. Yeah. The other one is uh, just a plain spaghetti with tomato sauce, but only 35 calories. Mm. Um, and then we have a Japanese curry. So how hard is it to create the ready-made as opposed to just the noodles? They have to find a whole new source of uh, suppliers and partners and, and the whole bit. It's like entering a, you know, a new business. Yeah, a completely new business. So which one was the hardest out of those three? What was the hardest to source and actually produce? Um, the, uh, well, the Tom Yum and the Curry are, are the same company. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is you, know, you get to meet people you know, as you, you know, are doing, you know, you attract certain businesses yeah. that do things for you. They're health so, conscious. You mean what, like, what, what do you mean you attract? Like, you know, cause I'm in kind of a small niche kind of uh, noodle. So all right. the noodle, all the companies that deal with my noodle, they know who, they know who I am. And I so see. the spaghetti with tomato they sauce, want your business. they came to me and said, look, we can do this. So that one was actually pretty easy. You just had to like take out some of the bad ingredients, you know, cause Obviously, we try to keep it as clean as, as we can. So how many options do they give you? Because you know, a tomato sauce could have, like you said, a slew of ingredients. How do you decide what to keep in and what to subtract out? Well, I tell them what I don't want. Like I don't want any seed oils like sunflower, safflower oil, only, only olive oil, you know, no MSG, um, you know, those sorts of things that are like things that I just don't want in any of my products. So then they send me samples and we... You know, one of them had, as an example, like um, yeast extract, which some people think is very much similar to MSG. So we took it out and really tasted not that good after we took it out. <laughs> they came back and they said, well, we'll add a lot more on onions and garlic. And so they added a lot more onions and garlic and it actually came which out Which is fine. much healthier for you anyways. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, that bad stuff tastes good. We need to add... It MSG really does make things taste better. I mean, it's it's, it's the truth. It yeah. just... So what was the biggest thing from the last trip to China, Japan? What was the, the highlight uh, for you from a business standpoint? You know, I had a little bit of a, oh, I guess you could say a little bit of a bias um, uh, against dealing with China for anything. Um, and that was a premature bias based on news reports and such. And right. so I got to see a few factors. Because it's had a bad rap, you mean? Or? Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, the noodle is kind of a Japanese product, so I try to keep keep it, you know, respect. Authentic. And such, exactly. I gotcha. So, but after going to China, meeting with business owners and such, and seeing the country, you know, I feel a lot more comfortable, you know, if I choose to do some, some business with them, right. you know, that, that it should be okay. So is there a fear from working with other, these companies that work with other noodles that there's any like competitive, you know, intel or anything uh, that things get passed along to other companies? How do, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've had that happen where I've come up with an idea at my end and the person that helped me uh, come up with that product then sold it to someone else. That was a- uh, Really? That was, yeah. Wow. I mean, now now there's multiple. It's like a worst nightmare, right? It's like you. It was yeah. It was poor poor business uh, etiquette for sure. <laughs> poor. You're, you're very. <laughs> that's putting it lightly. So yeah. what's how do you prevent that? Is just do you have them sign something, or that yeah. doesn't even matter? You know, if they sign it, they could still do it. Now, no. Now, if I come up with an, with something that I consider to be innovative, I, I you know have them sign sign off on it that they won't give it to anyone else. Yeah.
Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Dr. Jonathan Karp, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Thank you, big thank you to Kevin Thompson for introducing me to the next awesome guest and his great products, which I have actually purchased and do eat. We have Dr. Jonathan Karp, founder of The Miracle Noodle, and he founded it after visiting a friend in Japan. The Miracle Noodles have zero calories and zero net carbs. I did not believe it, Jonathan, until I actually looked at the package and tried it. I'm like, how is this possible? Which you'll talk about. And the company has sold millions of packs of noodles worldwide. They've been featured on Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, all over the news and media. Dr. Karp, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. And so how is it possible that these pack of noodles, and I I meant to bring mine. I have some in my refrigerator at home. I meant to bring them and I forgot them. How is it possible that these noodles have zero calories and zero net carbs? Well, they're made from fiber and water, so fiber doesn't have any any real caloric uh, value. So the noodle, the the nature of the fiber is that it holds on to an enormous amount of water. Mm-hmm. So the noodle itself is actually ninety seven percent water mm. and three percent plant fiber. So mm. it basically makes it calorie free, carb free, wheat free, soy free, gluten free. So are like diabetic patients just love you? Diabetic patients are, yes, we definitely have a, a large segment of, of, of people who we have, you know, our, our business is kind of divided into people who are on special diets and then people who are just trying to lose, you know, lose weight or just eat healthier. And then inside that segment of people who are on special diets, they're, you know, obviously diabetics play, play a big role in that. Yeah. And um, you aren't, you don't just play a doctor on TV, but you actually are a doctor. And we'll get into some of your background and also where you got this idea from, which we talked a little bit about. But first I have to ask, because we have a lot of you know, e-commerce, people who you know, have their own businesses, and I wanted you to hit on some highlights of what really works in the trenches with boosting sales. And then we'll talk about some of the, the big challenges. Start with what, what works with actually you know, making sales for the Miracle Noodle? Well, I think it's um, trying to trying to segment our audience properly so that we can communicate them to them, you know, specifically, whether mm. that be somebody on a unique, like, diet, like ketogenic diets, yeah. paleo diets, and then always be split testing. You know, we're constantly split testing. Um, to me, that's kind of the funnest part of, yeah. you know, it's the most scientific part, you know, that kind of appeals to that part of my right. science background. And, um so between those two things, I think you know, I think that's what makes the biggest difference for us, at least. What's a fun split test that you did that maybe shocked you a little bit? Um, we had something really peculiar. Uh, this was a split test for an ad, actually. Okay. We, we found it doesn't work anymore, but for a while we found we were getting um, we were getting traffic from a tarot card website that was converting really, really highly, and we actually uh, started testing ads on uh, on other you know, testing ads on other tarot card websites, strangely, yeah. and including kind of unusual messaging in, in those. And then for around six months, we actually had, you know, really good conversion rates from those oh. particular ads. So that Why was do like, you think? Why do you think that is? Maybe the demographic, uh, maybe more women, you know, I don't know. You know, I don't know the exact demographic of people looking for for tarot cards, but that was kind of the most bizarre and unusual. That is one. weird. What yeah. made you even think to advertise on one of those sites? Well, we we I had some organic traffic coming from mm-hmm. you know someone who had placed a few comments on like on a tarot card website, and I noticed that those links were converting at an incredibly high rate. I guess you know that's why that's another reason you know another thing to say that you know you really need to be on top of your analytics because yeah. sometimes you find little pearls of wisdom in there yeah. that you're like. Wow, I can't believe I'm getting traffic from from this place. So definitely, we look at our at least the referring traffic. We look at the, those, you know, all the time. Yeah. So rule of thumb: advertising tarot tarot <laughs> card sites. <laughs> you know, it didn't work too long. This was like why did years. it stop working? You, well, I, well, Google. You know, you know, this was I, I was taking ads out on Google on years ago on Google. Yeah. You could, you know, there was no quality score really a long time ago. So. 
obviously those ads don't necessarily make any gen, gen, yeah. you know direct sense. I see. For, and so eventually it just didn't work anymore. Can but you just go buy direct ads on these sites or something? You can, uh, but you know we we let's, got let let's down. Let's call one up right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, there was, you know, bigger fish to fry, so I kind of let. I got gotcha. you. Cut off the that's... middle, man. We don't need Google. Just like let's call up <laughs> Toro. <laughs> that, that makes me think. Like you need to be coupled with that infomercial, that famous infomercial. I forgot what it's called. Oh, Diane it's... Warwick or whatever her name is. Oh, okay. I was thinking of the the, the Jamaican uh, psychic lady. Oh, remember? that's what I'm talking about. Or maybe yeah. it's someone different. I don't know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's, it's like Cleo. it's Cleo or something. Sponsored like by Miracle Noodle. <laughs> Yeah. When you make a million off this, we'll, we'll look back at this interview. Um, <laughs> so what else works with – yeah, obviously, what else have you found with the analytics that you need to focus more time and attention on? Um, well, if we have certain, certain traffic coming from certain places, then we need to figure out a way to make sure that those people get segmented properly. That's actually a continual challenge that, that we have, um, figuring out how to really – we've been working on segmentation now for a while. Yeah. Yeah, um, because we've seen it work, um, but it's it's a continual challenge. For How sure. do you segment them? Like, if they're coming from a certain site, you send them a certain page, or what works? Yeah, we have that. Um, now we're we just switched over to uh, using Infusionsoft um, okay. a couple weeks ago. So we're basically what were you be using before? Mailchimp. Okay. So, so I mean, we we have rough segmentation there. I have you know six. Um, custom mailing lists or i should say top health topics we have diabetics we have uh, a diabetic mm. list a carb list yeah a kosher list um mm. um two more that i can't think of right right now and we have uh, autoresponder content you know up to a year's worth for each of those uh, newsletters so people are constantly getting good value um good educational content so yeah I want you to talk a little about that, actually, the newsletter, because I know right now you're going in the direction of the company is coupling products, right, with the educational component. So yes. talk about what, what started you going in that direction, and then we can talk about some of the content. Well, partly it has to do with the fact that I feel more, honestly, more fulfilled as a business owner and a physician if, I, if I'm educating people on health. I mean, yeah. this is been a passion of mine right. and for a long time I thought to myself how is it that I can incorporate You're like I went to 20 years of school <laughs> I might as well use some of it yeah, exactly and I you know I have a nutritional interest in my practice um, uh, so for you know I'm a dermatologist um, so I have a specific interest in the treatment of autoimmune disease for yes. uh, diet using diet and lifestyle for autoimmune diseases yeah. like psoriasis lupus etc so I, I thought, well, you know what, I'm, I'm going to start my own web, you know, I'll start my own website, you know, drcarp.com, and then I, I, I don't have time, you know, to cultivate all these, I'm busy, so, yeah. and it occurred to me, like, well, I have all these people who are really looking, they're health consumers, for, for overwhelmingly for health sure. consumers, for sure, um, and so we kind of switched the mission of the company over the last couple months to be, you know, a, a health food company that introduces you know, traditional ingredients and pairs it with education. Yeah. And I don't know of many other uh, food companies that, that you know, do that. And so that's kind of the mission statement of the, of the businesses has changed over the last couple of months. And now we're in that building period right now. Yeah. I don't know many other companies that was founded by an MD either. So a, a food company. Yeah. Um, you be surprised though, you know, when, we, when I go to trade shows. Yeah. There are, there are a decent number of doctors who really? start. Uh, I mean, not a, I shouldn't say decent number, but a handful. And more than should. you thought. <laughs> yeah, more than you would think. You thought you'd be the only person in the room, essentially, and there's one other person. No. No, there's, a, there's a decent number, and, you know. So talk about the educational component. So what type of education are you providing um, in the newsletter that, that you find resonates with your audience? Well, we're still testing that out. Mm -hmm. um, to, in fact, today, the first one of the first newsletters that we sent out that was really very detailed, hopefully easy to read information mm -hmm. that got sent out. And we'll see what the response is, is for that. But actually, today was the first day where we, we've had health newsletters all along, but this one was really detailed and yeah. went through. And, you know, I, and 
part of what I mentioned before about segmentation is we're going to need to figure out which part of our list really enjoys this sort of detail. Right, right. Because you don't want you want people who want it to get more of it. Of course. Yeah. And so, on- what Go was ahead. so detailed? What did you include in it? Is it recipes well, it was- to what? Like what is in it? It was an article on uh, fruit sugar fructose. Okay. And what, what is it safe? Is it not safe? And it you know it had a lot of references and yeah. and study study references and such. So it's a little more scientific, yeah. I guess you'd say and. Yeah. And again, it's that segmentation is key. So as we as we are dealing more with Infusionsoft and we have a specific call to action for these people to tag themselves and we know who, who wants this level of detail, then, you know, things will start to, you know, things will start to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll we'll hit some of the highlights, some of the milestones, but I can't leave the conversation of boosting sales without talking a little bit about the retail distribution because you have a, a huge retail distribution. I mean, I bought it at one of the local supermarkets in Chicago. So what what has helped with getting into retail? Well, retail has been a challenge because I I've started websites for many, many years. Um, and I'm so I'm I'm you know fairly familiar with with online e commerce. Yeah. Uh, so jumping into the retail market has definitely been a challenge. So as far as what's helped really talking to the the most important thing has been talking to other people in other small businesses that are selling in retail it's a totally different business in every way and has its you know it it, there's a a a big learning curve there and amazingly all the people that are in the retail business retail food business unless they're you know a direct competitor they are very and to helping because everyone's kind of been through it and yeah. made a lot of mistakes and so so it's it's important just to to network and talk to people at these and that's why it's important to go to these shows the trade shows so who was the person who was the biggest help for you did you meet him at a trade show um the big you know i can't i can't pinpoint any one person uh it's just talking to the people next to you at every show you pick up a, a tidbit here and a tidbit there there hasn't been one particular yeah. Or I wish I wish I would have found someone yeah. who could really be kind of a mentor in that in that space. I'm looking to hire someone um, who's right an now. expert. Yeah, who's been in the business for a while, who can really take take the business from where I you know because I don't know that business. Right. A 30 year veteran knows it, and I'll never know that. And then you you know you have to acknowledge that if you're jumping into a new right. business, one of the first things it was a challenge for me because I knew you know you jump into a business that you think you can learn. There's so much subtlety, no matter right. what you do. Right. Someone, you need someone to help you. Right. So anyone out there knows someone who, what are you looking for? <laughs> Probably 15 years experience uh, managing a, like a distribution. consumer brand, okay. basically, for right. retail. Yeah. Anyone hey. out there oh. knows that, email. Yeah. Please. There's a contact, wherever, whatever page you're on, I'm sure there's a contact form. Um, and so, yeah, that's from the retail distribution end of things. Um, and what about from big challenges? What things, what's some words of wisdom, mistakes that were made or big challenges you had to, to fight through? In, in the retail business? No, in general. Actually, with the retail, I want you to just mention, so where are you distributed? So we're in around, I would say around six to 7,000 stores. Wow. Uh, we're in most of the Whole Foods. We're in uh, Sprouts, um, Meyer, um, in Southern California, some of the Kroger brands like like Ralph's, um, uh, other big chains. Um, so why do you need someone? It seems like you got that pretty pretty well uh, nailed down. Because you know, getting in is twenty percent of the of the work. I see. Because, okay, you get in. You, now now it has to sell. So, right. and you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of cost to get getting in. Some stores have what are called slotting fees, which is where you actually pay them to get into your store. And if, if you're talking about a store, you know, let's say Safeway, which has, you know, hundreds of stores, right. you have, and you have to spend, you know, let's just say 25 bucks per product. Yeah. Then, so then a lot you have adds up. $75 times 200 stores, you know, that starts to, that starts to add up. And right. then what doesn't sell? Yeah. So what happens if it doesn't sell? Do they, 
do they send it back to people? Like what? Yeah, you, you have to you absorb the cost. The distributor charge you get a charge back from the distributor. It's a scary uh, thing. Yeah, and there have been many. I know I've met many people who, uh, as an uh, that's why the Safeway example came up. Uh, were, that they thought that they they get in, they're so excited. You know, maybe a small mom and pop operation right. where you know they make their own whatever spaghetti sauce as an exit or something like that, and then they get into Safeway. They're jumping for joy. They've got a you know a couple products. It's like seventy five thousand know, dollars sometimes just to get in for a couple products, right. and it doesn't sell, and it puts you out puts you right out of business. Yeah, your wor- you celebrate. It could be someone's worst nightmare. What exactly. Happens. It could be the worst thing that ever happened to them. So you do have to you do have to choose your challenges. Uh, we we focused a lot on on obviously the natural food stores like Sprouts, yeah. Whole Foods, and 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 independents, small independents. And then you know as time goes by and we kind of make the jump to to conventional stores, you know you have to you have to choose your battles and you choose your, choose your stores which ones you feel that you'll you'll do well in. Yeah, and not just take every store that. That wants you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, just knowing your background, you're a very well researched, thought out, in you know, individual. How did you know you were ready to do that retail uh, side of things? Um, I didn't know I was. Oh, you didn't. <laughs> That's the short answer. I mean, you know, you never really. The e-commerce business has always been the fuel of the business, yeah. and is what I know. So it was a, a bit of a leap into the unknown for sure. But th- those are those are challenges that we all. <laughs> usually like to take when we're entrepreneurs. Yeah. So what was another challenge that people should watch out for, you know, running their business? Um, hire, hire slow, fire fast is, is, I don't know who, who said that, you know, but that, that is the truth. You know, I never had to hire really anyone until, uh, you know, being a physician, you, especially in an HMO where, where I, where I was working full time, you know, I just come in and I, see patients and I go home and so learning how to hire you know mm. I I use a system called uh, lighthouse consulting which is mm. um, kind of personality profile okay that then they they do your personality profile and then they do your applicants personality profile mm-hmm. and then you have a talk with uh, the person at lighthouse and they go through certain things and whether there's a match and what they, they can even tell whether the person is trying to make themselves look Really? Better than they are on the on the actual test, hmm. um, so that's been been helpful. So, what was the key position that you've hired for that was really important? Um, probably just administrative assistant. Mm-hmm. That was my most important important one to have kind of a personal assistant to to take the load off a lot of what I'm doing. What was the ideal personality for you for your personal assistant? What what was the Organ- person- organization? For sure, because I, you know, I have so many things going on. I need help organizing things. It's not my natural. Really, I'm surprised. Yeah, it's not my natural. I wouldn't. Skill. Have, I wouldn't have guessed that. So, did you make your sisters and parents fill out the uh, personality questionnaire? I actually had my sister uh, fill it, and it was very helpful. Actually, I, th- I mean, it's helpful just personally when you read it. It's like a 12-page report, and it's it's almost when you read it, you're you're like. You almost blush because it's like, oh wow, that's that's pretty yeah. that's pretty on. Yeah, I reference it obviously because I read that you hired your sisters and your parents early on as a business, right? It's true. Yeah. So have you yeah. had to fire one anyone yet? No. Okay. <laughs> no. It's like thanks. It makes Thanksgiving awkward. Um, yeah. But um, how is it working with family? I mean, people obviously work with family all the time. It can be great and it can be challenging. What you know. What things should be people be looking out for if they're working uh, with family? Well, uh, <laughs> that's a tough one. The my you know the the positive is that we see each other a lot more. You know, my sister uh, works full you know full time obviously in an office in New York, and then I I'm here in California, and my parents are between San Francisco and and Florida. Okay, and we probably wouldn't see each other, each other as much if it wasn't for you. The have a reason to talk more. Exactly, and and then when we do these trade shows, which are you know around once a month, we do a trade show. Oh, wow, so, that often. Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy and tiring, and definitely not some. It's one of the things I don't particularly like the most about it. But you have to do it. You the connections you make are yeah. 
are just great when you go to these things. So, so are they always in Japan or are they all over? Where are the trade shows? Yeah, I mean, right now, actually, my sister and mother are at a trade show in Atlanta. Okay. I, I got out of that one. But uh, then, uh, let's see, then next month is the biggest trade show in the U.S. With, for natural products, which is called um, Expo West, Natural Products Expo West, mm -hmm. and that's in Anaheim. And it's, Where it's is it? In Anaheim. Okay. It's huge. I mean, it's like multiple football fields. Wow. As far as your the eye can see, and it's just all natural natural food products, yeah. and it's really the, the the big show for for the U.S. So when you go, Jonathan, when you go to the trade show, what do you want to do? Like, do you have some, what do you have in mind that you actually want to accomplish? It's a little bit different for each one. I yeah. think you know, as an example, for the next show, we we have this new product, these new products that we're debuting. So it's really important us for us to be you know pretty aggressive at our booth, getting mm -hmm. people into the booth and actually in that case my mother is she's this very outgoing mm. incredible woman and she she just she has no fear she just grabs people literally grabs people <laughs> puts them into the booth and i gotta tell you our some of our our biggest stores that we've gotten like um heb which is a big chain in texas with a couple hundred stores mm. we got because my mother was pulled over the you know, one of the buyers from the store and, um, you know, and they're just, she's like, just very persuasive. I and mean, she's, you know, she always says that she learned this because, you know, her, her family, she grew up in Philadelphia and they were all, you know, uh, merchants and there was uh -huh. always a bunker outside the store, you know, years. It's in her blood, stuff. huh? What's that? It's in her blood to. Yeah. And, and when she's doing it, she's having so much fun and she just says kind of like my, my aunts and uncles, you know, when they would pull people into the, the clothing store that the family had. Mm. So what works? Like when you pull someone in to the booth, how does it work? Do you have a demo set up or what, you know, what attracts their attention? Well, we, we spend a lot of time on our, on our mm. trade show booth. Um, yeah. And we make sure that we have a lot of food to sample. Yeah. So at the last show... A full did, stomach is key, right? That's, yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> We had at the Fancy Food Show, which was last month in, in San Francisco, we served uh, five dishes um, and we had, you know, people in line, you know, and then my mother would, would do her thing and and make a personal connection with each person. It's, you know, you're making an individual sale every time, you know, you, you talk to someone and obviously making a personal connection is, is what she's good at and it's what works. Yeah. And for this, the goal is obviously get in front of uh, maybe a big retailer that will sample it and want to try it out, test it in their stores. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. The buyers are walking around and um, a lot of times you'll see booths of people that are just like sitting in their booth waiting for people to come up to them and, you know, they just, you just, it just doesn't work. Yeah. And, you know, going back to that question about working with your family, yeah. you know, my mother and my sister, they, they're, you know, it's hard to find an employee that cares as much. Right. And it shows when we're at a, when we're at a trade show how much they care yeah. and how much they believe in the product because look we we get emails on a daily basis from yeah. people who, who's you know who have their diabetes under control yeah. cholesterol has gone down they yeah. you know just incredible stories all the time. What's so, one of your favorite stories that came in? Probably there was a, there's this guy his name's uh, Steve Lombardo he mm -hmm. sent in an email. And again, these are all like unsolicited. We just get emails. And he was scheduled for gastric bypass. And his daughter got him these noodles. He's obviously a yeah. Italian. And he started eating them. He lost like 10, 10 12 pounds. Wow. He canceled the surgery. Or he postponed the surgery. And then he postponed it. He kept eating. You know, in other words, he was using the noodles as a carbo as the carbohydrate. What he would normally eat for the carbohydrates, he replaced with a noodle. And just that alone made him lose the weight? Yeah, he was, of course, starting to exercise. And, yeah. and, but when he saw that he could do something without feeling deprived, yeah. he actually delayed the second surgery, and then he delayed it again, and now he's lost close to 200 pounds. That's so, unreal. Amazing. He's, is there a before and after on your site, on this picture? Okay. Yes. Go to, uh, you go to uh, the testimonials on okay. our website. You go to miraclenoodle.com, and there's like a testimonials tab. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I actually have his name written down. So I must have seen it somewhere because I have his name written down on my notes right here to make sure you you it's talk amazing. about it. Yeah, that is amazing. You know what would work for the trade show is you're a magician, a card magician. What? If, yeah. 
It's true. <laughs> so, a fun fact about you is you actually did an audition at the Magic Castle, right? That's true. So, how how did that go? How did you get into Magic? Uh, I had a patient. Well, I've always had kind of an interest. I mean, like anyone else, or, or at least people who enjoy watching those sorts of things as a kid. Yeah. Uh, I had a patient who was a magician at the Magic Castle, and I expressed an interest, and he said, you know, they have classes over there, and I started taking classes, and this is, uh, if people don't know what the Magic Castle is, it's basically a private magician's club in Hollywood. Yeah. So the magician's Very basically- famous, yeah. Yeah, pretty famous. I mean, most of the magicians in, in the world live in LA and Vegas. I mean, that's just, and so it's a private club. Um, I took the classes, and then at the end of the classes, well, you can audition at any time, but anyway, at the end of the classes, I, you know, you have to prepare for a ten-minute performance, yeah. and and uh, yeah, I, I thankfully passed. And do you still do any of the tricks? Like, yeah, I do some do? tricks. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, not as practiced as I was then, but yeah, I definitely All do right. tricks. Well, if I ever meet you in person, I want to make sure I get yeah. the full magic okay. experience. Maybe not ten full minutes, but I could. Try to <laughs> no, I would. I want to make you do that. Um, so yeah, so the trade show, so you do one a month. What, you know, the, the Expo West seems like it's a big one. Any other ones that you feel that this is, you know, you'll never miss this one? Fancy Food Show is the, is the other. There are, two, there are two Expos and two Fancy Foods. One, mm -hmm. one is uh, Fancy Food San Francisco, Fancy Food New York, and then Expo West, which is Anaheim, and Expo East, which is uh, usually in Baltimore. So yeah. those, are the, those are the main, the big ones. Yeah. So any other mistakes that you wish, don't, don't wish upon your enemy or that you wish you would have avoided? <laughs> wow, that's a toughie. Um, gosh, you know, you make mistakes all the time. I mean, that's just the nature the nature of things. I'm just trying to think of one that was particularly painful. Um, you know, nothing, nothing's really coming nothing's to mind. Nothing's coming to mind. I don't know if there's anything on the, like the marketing front, like you thought something was going to work really well and it just didn't. Yeah. I, okay. I mean, there. You know, you all these your products are bought by distributors who then sell them to stores, and the distributors use you as they don't make money just from selling your product. They make money. You're like a cash. You're you're a cash cow for them. I mean, in the sense that you have, they want you to do trade shows. They want you to do ads. And so some of those ads can be very very expensive. Because so, they just want you to sell as much as possible. Is that why? No, they actually, you, they know, a lot of the distributors know that these ads have no effect oh, wow. at all. So why do they want you doing them? Because they know that a lot of people are new to the business and they think that it sounds great to put an ad in, in this particular place and that it's, it's, uh, it's unfair, but that's the way it is. It just sounds good. Exactly. But won't you then end up not liking them because they're recommending you do this ad that just not doesn't work? I mean, I don't. Get, why would they it's, recommend that? Yeah. They end up not liking them, but there's no other person to sell your product because that particular distribution business, there are only a few players, and you're you're stuck using using them. So this is this is the these are the these are the things like when you're online and you're dealing directly with your customers. Obviously, that's a whole different dynamic, and right. it's also much more comfortable for me. And now dealing with all these third parties, yeah, business is business can be tough, and um, there's a lot of schemes out there to, to yeah. get your money. No that's doubt crazy. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back a little bit to the start of your journey of actually why you even created this. But before that, like, so from what I read in the beginning, you were in Japan and you discovered these, but but what was happening in your life at the time, like your practice? Because um, obviously you're a practicing doctor at the time, right? Right. Well, I had always started businesses. You have, okay. Like what else did you start in the past? Uh, well, as a teenager, yeah, I had a friend of mine who, who we sold all kinds of gadgets in the summertime, you know, from one of the, one thing that just pops into my head is we had this beach towel that, or beach blanket that wouldn't get wet. It was made from like parachute material. Oh, okay. and. And you get up, and the sand would blow off of it, but it wouldn't ah. go away. And then the water would go through it. Smart, yeah. So I mean, we did things that we became distributor for that. And actually, my friend, who who's been, it's one of my best friends, is actually now uh, chief marketing officer for Guthy Renker. Oh know. wow! Seriously, He's, he he went that direction. I always stayed with an interest in marketing, 
Uh, he really pursued it, and now he's, you know, well, probably one of the top marketers in in, That's in the country. Huge. I actually That's- saw Greg Ranker speak, um, and they're just doing unreal things in the marketing world, from online to info marketing. I mean, no, the people don't know what that is. I mean, they one of their products is Proactive, which is a billion dollar, yeah, you know, brand. Yeah, and they do uh, Cindy Crawford, uh, all of her stuff, and. I, I, I don't think they do Tony Robbins, but they did. They used to do all of Tony Robbins stuff. I mean, they're so now he's yeah he's head marketer there. So he he's so anyway. It's just an interesting thing that he went that direction. I always kept an interest in marketing, went into medicine and such. And then online, I had um, I had some ebooks that I sold uh, before I before I started this particular company. So I already knew how to set up a site and get orders and I knew basic uh, direct marketing principles yep. I'd read you know, we read Jay Abraham as, as teenagers yeah who are your favorite direct marketers so Jay Abraham who else um, uh, Dan Kennedy yeah uh, probably like Perry Marshall so do you call your friend the CMO for advice what advice does it give you with with marketing yeah what's amazing is Guthy Ranker is right down the street from where I live oh I so, didn't know that okay so it makes it even more amazing that when he came to interview and I was the one that took him to the interview. I thought, well, how perfect. It's like we started these businesses and now you're interviewing for uh, Gothi Ranker. Anyway, um, the – sorry. I, Any good your... advice marketing for that you've gotten from him now that he uh, basically – deals... Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean when you're marketing at that level and then he has – you know, he flies up to Facebook and meets with the top, you know, right. ad guys there. There's always little, little things that are coming down the road. That I hear about nothing, you know, nothing top secret. Just, yeah. But yeah, every time I every time I meet up with him, just we always talk shop, and uh, I'm doing stuff on like one hundredth of the level that they are. But it, you know, the basic marketing principles still hold. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about conversion and such online, and so it's always fascinating to yeah. talk. Yeah. So what has he told you that you implemented right away that you maybe hadn't thought of or you're doing a little bit of? Hmm. Um, well, I think different things about understanding what's happening with, with, with um, you know, attribution of conversions. Because now, what's fascinating about it is that it used to be, you know, you took out an ad and then you could directly attribute where your sale was coming from. And this notion of attribution becomes a lot more difficult when you have so many cross-platform ads, and right. so trying to kind of get a hold of that um, and have an understanding of, you know, how to how to make, you know, how to attribute this amount of ad spend to this conversion. Because right. they're seeing that's, it maybe on mobile, maybe they're seeing it on the website, maybe they heard a radio ad, at least for, for their, their stuff. There's so many different avenues, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, what I found fascinating when, when he spoke, when Greg Rinker spoke is, they just their their understanding of the lifetime value of their customer was mm-hmm. so I mean to to the finest detail. Right, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, so what did you want to be when you grew up? You were doing all these things. Obviously, you ended up doing dermatology. Now the company. What what was it when you were young? What did you want to do? Yeah, I, I wanted to be a doctor. My you did. Was... You always did. Oh yeah, yeah. My father was a doctor. Um... What was his specialty? General medicine and rheumatology okay. or his medicine, or, yeah. So why dermatology? I actually, for a long time, wanted to do that also. So <laughs> what made you go into dermatology? Dermatology is really the best specialty in medicine. If, if I mean, I, I guess I'm biased with that. But it, the reason it's it competitive. is competitive. It is competitive. Yeah. The reason it's so great is because, one, the lifestyle is, is very nice. I mean, generally, it's a nine-to-five job. It's visual. I'm a very visual person, so... The subtleties of doing a skin exam with differences in color, texture, mm-hmm. uh, all these different subtleties make it interesting. It's procedural, so you're always doing, you know, little not mega surgeries, but you're cutting out things and yeah. doing minor minor procedures. And then you see all age ranges from babies to to elderly, yeah. and get to know them over a long period of time. So you get a nice, you know, you get to know people and. Um, it has that nice combination of those yeah. things I mentioned. What's been one of the most memorable cases that you've had in your practice? Um, I'm just thinking what just pops into my yeah. head when you say that. I would say probably the most two two of my most amazing things is one patient who uh, had melanoma, metastatic melanoma, meaning it had spread. Yeah, 
It's horrible. And, yeah. Well, yeah. And he came in and he had tumors, literally external tumors popping up all over his scalp. Wow. And I thought to myself, you know, this guy's a goner. And he had a treatment that has like a 10, 10 to 15 percent chance of actually doing something. And he was one of those people that wow. it just everything melted away. And what was the treatment? This, it was interleukin two, actually an old an old fashioned treatment, but mm -hmm. still a small subset of people who who take it actually do do get cures on occasion. So he got that, and and it was it was the most miraculous thing I've ever seen. It went away, and now we're we're like six years out, and he's wow. it's totally fine. And um, those those types of stories uh, are incredible, and they, it reminds me that when I see somebody like that. And I honestly thought to myself, you know, this guy's a goner. Like I couldn't, I could barely hide it. And really, yeah, it was terrible. I yeah. And um, what it taught me is that you know, there people are not numbers, and that no matter how bad it is, there's always someone that's gotten better, no matter what it is. And yeah. you know, at least as a doctor, you need to maintain that hope because. You know, it really, I, I really walked in there, and when I saw that, I just, it was, you know. You freaked out inside. Yeah. Yeah. Why was he coming to you? Well, I diagnosed his melanoma. Oh. So, wow. And so we, we follow up. And I see. Symptoms and, and actually, when that happened, he didn't really, this was like a couple of years after he had had his yeah. first melanoma that we removed. Um, and so... He called and said, "I've got these things growing. I need, you know, I need to see see you." So he came in and, you know, when I saw, obviously biopsy to confirm what it was and got him got him off to get that get yeah. that treatment. Good thing he had Dr. Carp that found it in the first place, right? That's why again people should take a proactive approach with getting checked, right? Sure, everyone yeah. should get a yearly skin check and and know what's on their body and they should, you know, know what kind of moles they have and keep an eye on them for sure. So the start of the journey, you went to Japan, and it wasn't just that, right? But you came back and you saw an article, right? Yes. What did you see? Well, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about the noodle, and it was actually my mother. She always has product ideas. Really? She's, yeah, she's she's actually a genius. She really is. Her product ideas are incredible. Just uh, she, you know, all kinds of things that I've done with the business and. What is, yeah, give me an exam so, give me a few examples what are some of her ideas um, just different shapes that I you know I didn't really think of um, that's one example different marketing ideas like um, slogans she she has like a notepad that she comes up with uh, you know different different like little copy things that I that I test in in Google ads that mm -hmm. that uh, that have that have done really well like um, um, imagine a world where the noodles are calorie free. That one, we <laughs> That's good. For a while, um, she's like an a, a, a list copywriter. Sounds like yeah. She, and she and she comes up with them like all the time. So she'll call me and like, what do you think of this? Or I'm like, well, we can test it. You know, as I mentioned before, I'm like, I'll test any. You know, I'm constantly testing. So we'll we'll throw it up and see what happens. So, so you see this article in the Wall Street yeah, Journal. She called me and she said, "There's this article." And then coincidentally. I was Why was she calling you? I mean, was it because you just came back from Japan? That's sort of random. You like, she called me oh, for years. Okay. Because I've always been interested in business. Yeah. And we've all, we, I've tried beyond the ebooks and such. I've tried all kinds of other uh, little things to sell online and right. such. It's, it's always been an interest of mine. So okay. She, and business has always been an interest of hers. So she called me up and she's like, oh, this sounds like an interesting product. You know, as in maybe this would be a good business. Mm -hmm. And the most unusual coincidence was after I hung up the phone I uh, was watching I never watched Kramer it's like probably the only time I ever watched that guy you know Jim Kramer Jim, Jim Kramer the one on you know with the stock picking stocks and such yes on, yes yeah. it's like I, yeah I know you're talking about yes I've never I, I think that was the only time I was flipping the stations and for some reason I stopped and he he had mentioned the noodles as well really like just the just one of these weird synchronicities that happened and then I said well that's I kind of took that as a sign, and yeah. I, I started the website the next day, basically. So, did you was the website Miracle Noodle, or was there some other? Yeah. It was Miracle a, Noodle. What made you call it the Miracle Noodle? Just it it seemed miraculous, so that's what that's how the 
just you know calorie free fits all these diets so that's basically why I called it that so you start this then you buy that the next day what's the next step you take to to start the company next step was I bought a template on uh, template monster uh, for $65 and customize at that time I, I knew how to do use Dreamweaver that was what what uh, the HTML editor I had played around with that so I got the, the website up I contacted a company that that sold the noodles in the U.S. Um, that a lot, that said that they would drop ship an order if I if I got it. Put the website up. I again already knew how to take out a few Google ads, and I got a sale the next day. That wow. was how it started. So then, what was the next step from going from the other company? So you obviously tested it to see if it's actually going to work, which is smart before kind of full fledged going into your own product line and everything. So. Exactly. Well, what point did you transition to your own, your own products? Probably, well, that was that was March, and then in in, I guess January, February of of the following, from March to January, February is when, when we there was an article in a, a journal called um, uh, First for Women. That was what it was, and they actually did an article. And they they were profiling the noodle, and they called it the Miracle Noodle, not in reference to my company, but mm. just the same way I called it Miracle. That's noodle. just what rolled off the tongue when you thought about it. Yeah, yeah, and and they had the article actually was entitled Shirataki, the Miracle Noodle. So people were going on and googling not just Shirataki; they were googling Miracle Noodle, the most fortuitous thing that you could possibly imagine. And so people were coming to the site and. I pretty much sold out my supplier, and he didn't tell me that I that that he that I was sold out. And we went for a couple weeks without him telling me. And then he told me, you know, we've been out for th- for three weeks. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know. And wow. it was it was a disaster, of course. But we we got through it, and and um, obviously that was this that was the cue that I needed to really do this myself and, and get the product. Uh, Obviously, in a different way. In a different way. It's a good problem to have. So, I mean, again, you're still practicing at the time. So, yep. are you doing this like in the evening? Time. How are you how are you managing the time with this? At that time, yeah, I was. At that time, I just I remember, I remember that day when uh, the article came out, and my sisters were helping me a little bit as well because I was having to like forward orders and. It was there was like, no. Let me just check that skin tag, and then you're like going over here. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of a crazy crazy time, um, and that continued. I I still was full time for many years even after that, and yeah. it got to a point where I was working. I would come home at you know seven o'clock, and I'd work till two a.m. and wake up and see patients, and it was it was unsustainable, obviously, and yeah. giving up. The security of, of uh, being a physician it took me a long yeah. time to you know to 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 make that to make that yeah. choice. It's a difficult choice yeah. to make, and um, it took me a couple years to yeah. do that. It's not just a security though; it's an identity too, because you identify yourself and you work so long and hard to get in that position. So what? That's true. Yeah. I think how that, was the decision making for you? What was it that finally pushed you to? Okay, I really need to to go part time on this. I think it was the support of my family. Yeah. Honestly, I think they saw that it was not good for my health to to continue doing what I I was doing, and in a, in a sense, give me the strength of you know. I know it does may not sound like it's such a big deal, but again, it is. You are you're exactly right in saying you're kind of relinquishing a little bit of your identity in a way, and so their support probably is what allowed me to do mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And so when you went to source your own, get your own product, what was that process like? Um, basically dealing with different Japanese um, companies. You know, I, I sourced multiple Japanese companies, uh, found one, and then we started working together. I mean, you just have them send you stuff and you try it. What was that? What does that process look like when you are? Initially, uh, it was a little bit complicated because it was even for the, some of the U.S. Japanese companies that were, say, doing import-export, it was actually difficult to find people who spoke really, really good English, mm. believe it or not. Um, but eventually we found somebody um, who, who spoke good English and uh, was able to help us, you know, help us out. Did you have to go over to Japan, or could you kind of just do it from, figure it out from the United States? 
Yeah, then I was I was able to handle most of it from the United States. Yeah. So what was your first product that you came out with? Or did you come out with several at the same time? First product was basic the basic noodle that they've been eating in Japan for, you know, 1600 years, mm -hmm. which is just a basic noodle. Um, what we did was we, we named it Angel Hair to be a little bit more uh, Western-minded. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that point, we, you know, branched out into familiar shapes like fettuccine, rice, uh, or we, the rice is like the noodle put into the shape of rice. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then we spaghetti. added... Spaghetti. Yeah, exactly. Spaghetti. Now we have a spinach pasta, a garlic and herb pasta. Uh, it's just kind of the idea of westernizing something that's from from Japan. Yeah. And I want to talk about some of the milestones of the business. So what was the first major milestone you hit? Obviously, you you sold out, right, of the distributor. But from your brand, now you're you're raising the bar. You, you know, you're going up a level. You're taking more risk. What was the big milestone you first hit when you first came out with your own brand? The Probably the Rachel Ray mention was, and we were building a lot of, it was all direct marketing, a lot of Google Google ad AdWords. At that, that was really the foundation of the business, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we got mentioned uh, by a chef named Rocco Despirito, which you may have heard of. You know, I think I watched that that little okay. clip. It's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah so that and that was, was organic. Like it's not like you reached out to him. He just found it somehow. How did he even find it? Yeah, totally. He was. I'm not sure exactly how he originally found it. He's mentioned us a lot in his. Yeah you know, in his cookbooks and such. I'm not sure the, how originally, it might have been one of our Google ads, who knows, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. I never so asked. So Rachel Ray, what happened after you were talked about in Rachel Ray? We obviously got a deluge of orders um, from our website that were nothing like we ever <laughs> had before. I mean, we were getting orders every, you know, every like 15, 10, 15 seconds. I mean, pretty much uh, throughout the day and um, and that that was small compared to what happened when we got to mention on Dr. Oz really? many, many, many months later. It was insane. But um, and, you know, it was good. Like the Rachel Ray was was preparation for getting getting ourselves ready or at least capable for handling such a thing. What did you have to prepare? So after Rachel Ray, you're like, OK, we need to our processes or whatever. You needed to step it up. What did you what did you put in place? What was it looking like so that you could be ready for Dr. Oz? Um, basically, just building a system where, you know, the orders get get properly sorted and having a long discussion with our our fulfillment uh, company that we work with, making sure our inventories are are good, uh, getting getting all that ready. You know, my I'm lucky that although I don't have a warehouse of my own, I'm I'm his only client. So mm. we have a very obviously close relationship. <laughs> You're like you don't mess this up. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a very good relationship, and we've we've been together now for many many years, and um, we have a very what I think is good system for you know f order fulfillment and. I added. I had to add more customer service. Obviously, after that. Yeah. So, what do you? How does that work? How do you add customer service, and what does that look like? We have um, we have five people in the, in the Philippines. Okay. Um, like it's a not call a, center. It's our call center. Okay. We There are they're my full time employees. Uh, I have one main person there who's been very very good. And when we need someone, we just started doing um, evening. You know, having. Not twenty twenty four six basically six nights a week right, just right. to have someone so we just started that and basically K who is kind of my main customer service person is now been with us so long she's able to recruit new new operators train them us. recruit them exactly she came up with a great kind of uh, miracle noodle company manual a training manual and such for them to to go through so that's that's worked out really well how hard was that to set up now it's it's flowing right you have someone managing it customer service how was it to set up from the very beginning like anything else you know i i would say that i oh i had started i had started with a call center in pakistan mm. um, and had some trouble with that um it's mainly the accent was was a problem i think people the the accent from the Philippines is actually a lot more. People know it now, but it's still more recognizable. You can't tell. Yeah, sometimes yeah. you can. Some people can. For the most part. 
Yeah. I had an interesting, funny thing that happened a couple of weeks ago. We got a complaint that, that you know, they're like, you know, there are people who always don't like that you're using someone outside the country. And, but they're like, I know you're using someone outside the country. And we don't, we don't actually, if they ask, we always tell them the truth. We're in, you know, right. They always say, look, I've been with, I've been with Miracle Little for six years. There's no reason to hide it. Yeah. Of course. But there was a rooster in the background. So she, so, you know, you don't hear that. in <laughs> So, so she, I got, we got an angry email, like, you know, how dare you use, you know, you should hire, I'm, I'd like to hire more people in the United States, of course, but it, but I know you have someone because it's they're not in the U.S. because I heard a rooster in the background. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, so early on, what do you see um, for people who are actually this came across? I was talking to someone and they want to set up an actual call center, right? Did you you start with Pakistan? Did you think about the U.S.? What made you finally go to the Philippines? Um, well, the, as I mentioned, the accent, and then I said, let's let's try try the Philippines. I think I was I had come across a website called uh, onlinejobs.ph, mm, which yeah, is I've, I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. So, and I've used that for a lot of different projects. Uh, it's all people in the Philippines. It's a, like a Filipino job board. Yeah. Um, that's where that's where pretty much we got the first few people, and then uh, as K became more of an employee of ours, then um, she she started to organize things. Sometimes with her, you know, we have two of her relatives that, that work for us. Um, and we have a, you know, it works out really well for us. So what's your advice for managing virtual staff? Because that's also, you know, somewhat of a challenge for people. And they're always looking to, to outsource different components of their business. I... Thankfully, got very lucky with the people that we hired initially. Yeah. Now that we're hot, now that we brought on people to do nighttime calls, um, we are doing. Kay and I do a review of phone calls that are recorded every every Friday, mm -hmm. um, and then we give constructive feedback to to the callers because you know they're just getting started with us. Um, and I, I think the it's I you think it's very train them. yeah you want to train them and you want to. Make sure you're listening. You know that you're personally listening in to at least a sampling of some of these calls because that's your con. You know these are important. Yeah. These are it's your main contact yeah. with the company. What um, software do you recommend for that for people who like? Yeah, I want to listen in. Is there a certain type of software or company that people can look at to do that? We use. I'm not sure actually. I think we we used to use OneBox, which. Is it one box? I think it, I, I think that's what we're using. I'm not really sure, honestly, what software we use for that. Yeah, I'm not curious. Sure. Um, I know that phone numbers are through Skype, but then the the voicemail and the recording is not through Skype. It's through uh, a yeah. through another service. Yeah, I've used Callfire before. So hmm. anyone looking at that, that's that's another one out there. That's mm -hmm. that's there. Um, so next major milestone, obviously, Rachel Ray, Doctor Oz. Um, did you did you start initially with that the person who ships? I don't know. Is it like a three PL, like an individual three PL? Did you start with that person? Because that's pretty yeah. that's pretty good. If you started with that person, or did you? No. Yeah, we, we've been with them for most of the time. But yeah. I had, was with uh, another fulfillment company. Um, but I we ended up I ended up looking because I was looking. You know, the, there's so many fulfillment places, or at least in LA, it seemed yeah. around around where my medical office was at yeah. the time. So at lunchtime, I would look and look at different warehouses and such, and I settled on this this one particular one. It's good price and yeah. close. So Dr. Or Rachel Ray, Dr. Oz, what was another proud milestone for you? Um, in terms of like media mentions? It could be media mentions or just, just uh, the company milestone as far as selling more packages of the of the noodles. Yeah, I I think anytime we do an online campaign that has a good ROI, I, you know, I I consider being able to do, do those and build on those just to be. I see it more as an incremental, thing that you just keep on trying to continually, continually improve. Um, what about product development? Because that's also like managing, what's currently selling to where should we? You know, we talked in the very beginning of the call, which will include. Um, of what some of the latest products are. So how did that trend go from, you talked about the, the angel hair was the first product. 
what was the next in the product development line for you? The, the next was the fettuccine and the rice, and fettuccine and the rice were okay. the two, and those are still our top sellers. Those three, and then it made sense, of course, over the last year or so to start incorporating meals, and so that's kind of the next the next step. Yeah, how popular are the soups? I, I actually I was looking on today, and um, I love the soups and the noodles. Have those are those pretty popular too? They are. They're not as much as you know those top three but it's obviously everything's like an 80 20 uh but those those soups i were are made by a a company actually uh, just a woman who's like a in, really into creating healthy soups that i met at a trade show and i mm-hmm. said i just the ingredients are just so awesome in those yeah. all functional soups there's like a weight loss soup that mm-hmm. has you know herbs that that are you know can give your metabolism a little bit of boost and um and then we have a, a detox soup with just incredible ingredients yeah. in there. And I just thought, this is so great. You know, let's let's combine it with the noodles. Yeah. And that's mostly a uh, just an online. It's it's really too expensive to sell in stores, so it's kind of an online yeah product. Yeah. Um, so what about for you? What's your process like for launch? So you come out with a new product. What's the process for launching the new product? Well, we often test products because we ha- we built this list over the last you know many mm-hmm. years, and so we'll often test products. Mm-hmm. Like I, I sell some other people's products as well, and then after that we we ideally drop them into some sales funnel that we have to to see if uh, Smart. you know, and that's basically yeah. it. It creates a lot of flexibility. We're we're not really risking that much. Um, as far as the meals, I did a pre-sale using a software called Tilt, hmm. which uh, allows you to legally take in orders without having the actual product. It's almost like you're doing your own crowdfunding. Yeah. And and I'm, I we did a few, um, almost like a Jeff Walker kind of product launch, you know, like a miniaturized Jeff Walker product yeah. launch where we we introduced that we're going to have meals. This is what the meals are going to be, yeah. and and it's and really smart. Said, sales page and that helps us fund you know these particular meals yeah that's really smart and sort of what you did early on right you put the website up and then you just sold other product that you could drop ship so you're not risking a lot to see if it actually works before going all in and then you yeah just gain you know saw the interest yeah i never made that connection but that's yeah, true yeah that's smart nice um and so i know we talked about some of the challenges any other big challenges with um, the business in general that people should, you know, when they're starting in e-commerce or even in the middle that people should, um, you know, look at that they may be coming on the horizon for them. They haven't hit yet. Um, I think it's very, very easy as things start to expand that you end up doing way too much yourself. Um, so, and it, it really can be affordable for, you know, to, get someone to help you with that. And I, I even to this day, and I still do too much and I'm still in the process of trying to, trying to delegate. But as you, as you get busy, you still need to make sure that you're, you're learning about marketing or, you know, in my case, I feel like if I'm not constantly learning and I, I start to stray, you know, and from, from basic marketing principles. Mm-hmm. So I'd say, make sure you're not too busy, get, get help. And make sure you're cons- constantly, you know, on newsletters and reading and and testing, implementing. Yeah. So, Jonathan, I want to talk about a little bit some of the software you use to manage the business. First, I'm going to do a quick word from the sponsor um, because I'm always thinking about automation, just like what you're talking about, delegating, automating, and how I can do more in less time. So that's what actually I love about Scubana. It allows me to automate my inventory management without you know multiple fragmented spreadsheets. I can automatically send out inventory to any customer from any platform, and I can automate my purchase orders so when they hit a certain level, just like you were talking about, so I don't run out of inventory before we realize it after three weeks and we lose out on all these sales. Um, so you know, check out Scubana. It's a you know e-commerce platform. So what software do you use to manage your business? Um, we use Slack for communication. That's been a really big help for us. It's I, I'm not sure I could live without it yeah. right now um, because it really has cut down my my um, inbox. That's that's been huge. 
there's a there's a software thing called followup.cc. Yeah, I love that. Oh my gosh, I I honestly don't know what I would do without that. How I, do you I, use it? What what do you use it for that that works best? Well, since we've been talking about trade shows, I'll just as an example. If mm. I have all these leads after a show, you know, you have to think of these leads just like you think of someone online, where you need to make like six, five, five to seven touches with them before a deal takes place. Right. It's the same thing with just general marketing, even at a trade show. So, being able to organize the follow up and for me to, if they haven't gotten back to me in, in a week or two, to then be able to, without having to clutter to remember. My- yeah, exactly. That and then just cleaning my inbox. You know, if it doesn't need to be in there, there's something about having a clean inbox that just makes it's like it's like if you have a clean desk. You know, just you just feel better. At least for me, that's, that's important. Uh, what else? What about um, on the site itself? Like, um, do you use a certain shopping cart or is there a certain? T- well, we're migrating. We're actually in the process of migrating to to Shopify. Actually, oh, you are. We've been, yeah, we've been on. Uh, ASP.NET storefront for a long time, which is kind of a, which we've just kind of outgrown basically, and mm-hmm. so we're we're in the process of just really simplifying things, and so we're, we're moving all of our site, all of our international sites over to Shopify, and then integrating them with. Uh, there's a plugin for Infusionsoft, and then uh, a really good subscription um, app, which um, which is an important part of our business, the subscription program. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, just those two things are really important. So that's kind of, yeah. So that's, so that's what how that sounds like it's going to be a huge undertaking. Amazingly, it's not it's so not much. Really? Yeah. I mean, I have a call with a develop local developer, you know, in in an hour. But the it's it hasn't been. He's almost done, and so I've I've taken out a lot of functionality. Oddly enough, I just I need to. If you look at our site, it, it's it has it's kind of dated and. Um, and so, anyway, we need to just make it a little bit more modern and a little bit more mobile responsive. And, and Shopify just, again, we're getting rid of a lot of uh, stuff that we don't need and just kind of almost starting over again. So Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. So what, what uh, made you make that decision finally? Because, I mean, you've we were, been in business since 2006, so yeah. it's, it's been a while. Yeah, we well we've been with multiple we we've, we've been on multiple shopping carts what's happened with this one is for us to upgrade we've made so many custom we've made so many customizations to the yeah. existing shopping cart we just can't we just can't upgrade the way we want yeah. and um and so yeah so that was that, that was really the decision i was thinking about going back to one shopping cart which is where i started the business cuz it has really good marketing follow up and mm-hmm. and um, i decided to go with shopify yeah you're going to be have a robust system with Infusionsoft and Shopify? I hope so. Yeah. So what else, anything else to manage the online component? Let's – oh, we use Ad, Ad Espresso for our Facebook ads. Okay. I started using them a couple – I've never heard of that. It's – you know, it's very difficult to do, or at least for us, to do split testing on, on Facebook. Mm-hmm. So this allows you to rapidly split test um, – ads on Facebook, which is important for, you know, for the sales funnels and such. So, um, what else online? Talk about the subscriptions uh, a little bit. Um, what do you find works with getting someone actually buying one to actually converting them into, you know, a subscription? Well, we have, we test, uh, a lot of the, we have it on the site so that people can sign up at any time. They get a 15% discount. Mm-hmm. And then we test different messaging to see what kind of messages work work best for getting someone on the subscription plan. And then when they're on the subscription plan, you know, we try to treat them extra, super extra nice. And you know, we we have bonuses and um, free free things that we send out. And you know, these are your most valuable customers uh, if they're getting product every month. And so even you know we could do better with that. We're always we're always constantly trying to to improve the 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 bonuses and and things like that. What's the most popular product to be on a subscription for? Um, the angel hair. The angel hair. It's, it's like the workhorse because you can use it as a spaghetti. You can use it as an Asian stir fry. You can put it in soup as a as a noodle soup. 
so it's very versatile and it's probably the easiest one for people to just jump yeah. in and start start using yeah i need to try your noodle soups for sure um because <laughs> i've just tried the, the angel hair probably because it was in the supermarket and probably the most popular one that they hold um well, that and it makes it you know it makes it a really full you know filling soup when you do that yeah Any so jonathan this has been fantastic so i thank you so much for your time with this um you know i always ask you know since it's the skubana e-commerce mastery series i always ask um what's been the lowest point in the business for you and then what's been the proudest moment um so what's been one of the lower moments you know because i know it's not always easy even though you were featured on you know rachel ray dr oz all those what has been the most challenging probably when when you know that initial supplier, when that supplier was just unable to fulfill, and I had basically close to a month of, of customers that we had to refund, and mm -hmm. I had to communicate with these people, that was probably, that was horrible, really horrible. Yeah. And especially because it was the beginning of the business, and you know, you're trying to be as good about customer service as you can, and it's difficult in the beginning. Yeah. So I think everyone should realize that as you start a business, it's difficult in the beginning to to get those sorts of details correct. Yeah. So that was probably that was probably the most. That's difficult. a good problem to have, but yeah, it is painful yeah. when you have customers who want what you have and you can't fulfill on it. How do you handle that that communication? Were you able to salvage any of those people? You know, they to were. actually. Uh, at that time, I didn't know how to to do it, and and uh, you know, as you know, actually, when I was talking to Kevin Thompson, a, a friend, mutual friend, obviously. I, I had a, a problem with just recently with uh, the meals. There's been a delay with the meals. Mm. I mentioned it to Kevin and some of his friends, and he and they all said, you know, this is an opportunity for you to te to communicate how great your business is and how unique it is yeah. because of this, of this. And so yesterday I'd sent out an email because it's like a six month delay on these meals, yeah. and I had to send out an email to people saying that you know we're we're delayed and. And I tried to turn it around the best I can. And amazingly, I got so many incredible responses from people like just, you know, it's okay. You know, I love your company. Thank you for mm. the bonuses. What and did so, you, yeah, so what did you say in the email? I said that, you know, I, I was honest. I'm a doctor and you, you all guys all know that I'm a doctor and I, I've been thrust into this business, you know, and I'm happy about having this business, but I underestimated the time to source new product to make sure it fits our health principles right, and right. you know vet all these the quality people. standards exactly yeah. yeah and the forms that are required for you know some of these are made in thailand so there's a whole oh other God. type <laughs> thing i'm getting a that, headache thinking about it yeah <laughs> so and and the, you know we had a couple refunds but it was worked out okay it's opportunity yeah i love that what about the proudest i know we talked about steve lombardo um yeah. what's been another proud moment for you in the company um, I, th I think it's, I think, like you said, I think it's mostly getting those particular emails. And then actually when we, we decided to put them all into one book mm -hmm. and then holding a book, this book that's, you know, probably 65, 70 pages oh, really? filled with just all of these amazing un completely unsolicited emails. Yeah. Uh, oh, I can tell you one really yeah. amazing story. I was on a plane, um, coming from a trade show. Actually, my mother was with me. And she was. She talks to. She's made business contacts. You get your mom on here. No, <laughs> she's talking to a, a, a guy next to next to her, and he said, "Oh, what do you do?" And um, and he said, "I know your product." He said, "My son has a seizure disorder, and we use the noodles because he's on a ketogenic diet, which wow. is a diet where you know you're incredibly low low ca low carbs, so yeah. that the person's in a ketogenic state." And it's been a lifesaver for us because he used to feel so bad about not being able to have noodles and right, rice. Right. And, and it makes him feel like he's a real You're kid. You're like deprived. Have, yeah. Like Mac, he can have mac and cheese with our, with our ziti. And he's like, and so that was, that was, I mean, the fact that it happened just spontaneously, yeah. I mean, that of course made me feel yeah. Made me great. Yeah. So. This should be in diabetic clinics or other clinics all over the nation, you know, Dr. Cobb, I really appreciate your time. I know you have a meeting right now. People should check out MiracleNoodle.com. Where else should people check out online? 
Uh, well, we're going to be starting Miracle Natural Foods. That's kind of when the Shopify site goes live because okay. we're be selling some other. And then, of course, I started a blog at drcarp.com okay. um, for some of the health education that, that we're going to be doing very soon. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's Thank been a you. pleasure. That's a lot yeah. of fun. I, I really, if we had more time, I would, it would be like phone a friend and we'll call it, we would conference in your mom right now and record it. But That would be. <laughs> maybe, another, maybe another day. <laughs> Awesome. Thank Thank you, Dr. Carpenter.